Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender, where we take a deep dive into the most important economic issues facing agriculture. I'm your host, Carly Jacobson. David Widmar and Brent Gloy are back with us from Agricultural Economic Insights, along with their own Val Weiss, a commercial lending officer here at Farm Credit. It never fails. As soon as we start talking about transition planning, both good, bad stories start to surface. And it's really no surprise because while transition planning is very personal, it's also something that every operation has to go through eventually. And in today's webinar, we'll set up some ideas to help you think through the transition of assets to help finance the next generation. So Brent, let me get this kicked on over to you to get us started. Yeah, it is great to be here again. And, uh, to actually follow up on a session we did um, exactly a year ago. So in June of, 20, of 2022, we talked about farm succession planning as well. And um, <clears throat> at that time, we talked about things like the capacity of the business to, to generate income, to support a transition, um, what the family needs were for income uh, and cash flow from that farm operation. And thirdly, we focused on what the growth opportunities might be for that operation. And I think, you know, if you're interested in this topic, you hadn't seen that um, webinar, it'll, it'll be available to you. You might want to check it out. But today we're going to talk a little bit more specifically um, about one of the things that's really important in these transitions, and that is transitioning the assets. And last time we used this, I think David came up with this really cool analogy of, um, you know, everybody has the problem of a farm transition. I mean, every, everybody's in the farm has got to decide, you know, what's going to happen to that operation. I think we've all been to a meeting somewhere and somebody started out with a an urn of balls and uh, like we talk about in statistics class a lot you know drawing balls out of urns i i could never really understand that uh at first but the idea was you know you start out with you know 100 farms and then you know maybe maybe 25 of them make it to the second generation and then of that group, uh, even, you know, fewer make it to the third and so on and so forth. And by the time you get down to five or six um, transitions, there really aren't very many uh, operations that go that far um, along. And so everybody has this problem. And uh, those are the kind of problems that, you know, people like to say, well, we can just come up with one solution that's going to solve this problem because everybody has it. And those are kind of like those cookie cutter houses you might see in the top left corner of your screen. You know, every, every you know, every solution is kind of the same. Every situation is the same. But when we get into farm transitions, that's not really the case. And, and you really need that kind of custom home that's depicted there in the bottom, that custom solution that every operation is just a, just a little bit different. And so... We want to talk about that a little bit today, and and I will say, you know, I remember uh, when I was leaving Purdue, uh, there was a farm management professor, Howard Doster, and Howard was a a, a unique individual, and um, um, I told him what I was doing. He spent a lot of his time thinking about farm transitions, and he just blurted out, kind of right in the middle of it, "Well, well, how are you going to buy out your sibling?" and uh, and so it was, it just kind of took me back because I hadn't even really been thinking about that. And, and it wasn't really that relevant uh, to the, to the deal, but, you know, it just goes to show that there's lots of uh, issues that are, that are involved in this. And one of the things I think David and I would like to say is, you know, at the end of the day, just do something and start this process. So if we think about why transitions have gotten more complicated over time, and I, I'm reluctant to say it's more complicated because the problems are always are similar, but there's one thing that's actually, I think, statistically driving some of that, and that is today farms have more are more likely to have more than one operator. So if we think back, you know, and to even 2002, only 38% of the farm operations had more than one operator most were sole proprietorships and when they came upon retirement you know they, they either found someone else to do it or they they liquidated the the assets and, and moved on today about half of the operations in the united states have 
more than one operator. And that complicates things because you're starting to deal with more errors and more complications, especially uh, if there are multiple operators in the business that want to remain in the business. And so it's a, uh, it, I think that makes it a, a little more challenging. As we think about how to do this, one of the things and one of the concepts David and I like to talk about a lot is, you know, you want to think of your farm as different business components. And one of the ways what we mean by that is I often think of it as um, you have a, a crop growing business and a crop marketing business or a livestock raising business and selling business. We also have like a farmland uh, might have a farmland investment business and uh, maybe an equipment enterprise. And those are all very different kinds of businesses. And, and I think it's important to think about those components because it gives us some options. When, when we think about the business that way with these puzzle pieces, it gives us some options. We start to think about transitioning um, the farm assets in the business. And Brent, I also like to add that you talked about you know, splitting the farm, maybe op operations, the actual activity of planting yeah. the crop or raising the livestock versus the land. And so this land holding company, or this land management company, that's one way that we could sort of split this. And this is one that we're going to talk about in the upcoming examples. But another one that can be common is thinking kind of, a, you know, thinking about the grain versus the livestock versus maybe a custom enterprise that happens. Maybe we're doing some custom spraying or custom um, manure application. So these are all ways that we can think about the business, not just as a as a box or a blob, but we can start thinking about the, the core components of it. And the other piece that we'll add to this here is it also gives us some uh, flexibility with regard to timing. And so maybe some of these uh, issues can be addressed uh, relatively easily. So maybe we work on the land component of this operation. Maybe that's a, uh, an easy one for us to transition. Maybe we start transitioning it right away. Or maybe there's other, such as the operations that we need more time to figure out, or we need more time to figure out how we want to pursue that. So thinking about the components, but also thinking about how you can structure those conversations in a little bit different way. And one reason why this operations versus uh, land component, these two components are really valuable, is they have fundamentally different uh, risks or fundamentally different uh income streams. There are very different elements to it. And so is this idea of, you know, the idea of inheriting a farm versus inheriting farmland. And if you think of on-farm versus off-farm heirs, the idea of inheriting a farm to someone that's off the farm, maybe a couple hundred miles away, uh, can seem a bit daunting. They're thinking about all the risks associated with the weather and what we're going to do with all this equipment, how we're going to manage depreciation, upgrade this equipment. But on the other hand, somebody who's on the farm, the idea of having that farm, having that equipment, that's very appealing to them. And so um, within, we have this pie chart here to kind of show how the farm assets are typically heavily skewed. Uh, this is an example, but you can think about this and measure it for your own operation. How much of your farm assets are in the land, how much are, are in equipment versus facilities. Uh, land across the US, across the entire balance sheet, accounts for a little more than 80% of all the assets in the ag sector. So this is a big chunk of the pie, and this is one area where we can start thinking about how we might allocate those resources, and how that might play out. So what we're gonna do in the next few slides is share a few examples and just provide you some ways that we can start to maybe uh, think about those different components of the business and how that might appeal to different stakeholders to help us get past this kind of ambiguous question of what we're going to do with this farm. Every farm has to go through a transition. What are we going to do and actually break it down into those components and maybe we can start to uh, process it a little bit. I was thinking about, um, actually, interestingly, a different professor at Purdue actually always had this idea of, you know, he always said, if you're going to take on an elephant, you got to eat it one bite at a time. And so a lot of times these businesses that have been successful over our career have turned into these big elephants. And now we have to figure out how we're going to uh, work through this problem of transition and we got to work through it one piece at a time and these components can help us with that so the first example 
we want to provide is probably a, one that's pretty common is there are on-farm and off-farm heirs. And the scenario here is the first generation wants both heirs to have an inheritance, but maybe all their wealth is invested or tied up into this farm and only one of those heirs is on the farm. So how do we go about doing this? This uh, on-air farm it has this business and when you start thinking about splitting this business up, it's really relevant to their livelihood. So one potential solution is the on-farm heir inherits the operation, which is the tractors, the barns, the livestock, and a portion of the land. And then the off-farm heir maybe just inherits a portion of the land. And maybe there's some covenants or some agreements that's in place about how those heirs will handle rental agreements into the future. Or maybe how they might handle selling the land back to the on-farm heir at some point in the future. There's a lot of details that can be happening there. But what's really valuable here is once you start to get through this idea or start thinking about these components and the potential solutions is it opens up a whole bunch of new questions such as, you know, how might we split this land? Do we split the land 50-50? Is there a different way of, of allocating that? Um, what particular pieces of farmland might the on-farm air be uh, find attractive or find uh, really sentimental? What pieces might the off-farm air find sentimental or might have value in? And so you can start to get past the ambiguity of this, how are we going to do it, and start getting down to some key components and start working through that. The second scenario maybe here is that uh, all the heirs are on the farm, but the first generation wants to retire and, and they have a lot of that, their equity and their retirement tied up in that operation. So they wanna think about how they wanna get out of this operation. And so one solution is rather than them showing up every day and working for the wa wage, maybe they start to get compensated for the equity that they've uh, accrued and invested in this business, kind of a reverse sweat equity or a, a buyout type of a situation. And as you start to think through this, you start asking questions like, okay, well, what does it mean for the first generation to retire? Are they still going to help drive a grain cart or maybe help move pickups around during planting and harvest season or help feed hay through the winter? Or are they completely uh, stepping away? Are they moving out of the farmhouse? Are they going to buy a place in town or maybe in, in Florida or Arizona. So we have a really good conversation about what that first generation wants. And then it opens up the door for the second generation to think about what they want out of the operation. How do they want to change the operation? How do they want to grow the operation? Do they want to equally buy out um, the first generation, their parents, or do they want to grow the different operation a little bit differently? So again, getting through some of those potential questions that could be helpful. And the third scenario here, uh, again, there's lots of countless different scenarios. This is what makes it this customized home problem is, but this is one that maybe we thought of would be a little bit common or maybe something for folks to think about is one heir is on the full-time operation. The other heirs has an off-farm job but helps out quite a bit, specifically with the livestock operation. They both contribute sweat equity, but only one's getting the salary. And so one potential solution here is the heir inherits the crop operation and, and a share or a portion of the land. And the second heir inherits the livestock operation and, and a share of the land. And again, what happens here is as we start to move through this potential solution, it opens up a whole lot of questions such as, um, what do those different heirs really want? Uh, how much of a livestock operation is uh, appealing to that second heir? Do they want a large scale type of operation? Is or do they want a portion of what currently exists? I think another thing that opens the question up is, is what does it mean to be fair? And what are their individual goals and what are their individual uh, professional and career goals? And how does this inheritance maybe fit into that? I, a little bit of an example here is is one op, one family member, uh, the first generation decided they wanted to transition some land to the, to the heirs. Well, there's one heir that was on farm. There were two that were off farm. So they gave the land to the heir that was on farm. And for the other two heirs, they said, well, the, the farm was worth about X according to the county appraisal. So we'll we'll write a check for this much, but we'll split it between the two off farm heirs. So you can set, okay, the land was worth this. And then this similar amount of cash was split between two heirs. So who got a good deal? Well, all the heirs were upset because the off farm heirs got cash and they got to go on a vacation and the on-farm heirs got this really valuable piece of farmland that nobody else had access to. And so this idea that gets raised here is as we think through this, always be considering what does the first generation have in store for their goals, personal and professional? What does the next generation have in store for their own goals? And how can this inheritance, how can this transition enable and help fuel those goals and those dreams and those aspirations that they have individually?
And David, those are those are all really good points. And I think as we kind of start to try and, and wrap this up and think about some of these other considerations that we might have, I think one of the things uh, you gave the example of, you know, everybody being unhappy. And I think one of the things that's really important in this is just be really clear with what your, your plan, intention, and motivation is, kind of the why behind uh, the decisions that you made. And, you know, that idea of fairness is really ambiguous. It means something different to everybody. And um, I think, you know, we all love our kids equally, uh, but I think we can all admit that our kids each have their own strengths and weaknesses. And uh, sometimes um, the, the, you know, just some of them may, may have more capacity for management than others. Uh, some may have more interest in it. Some may have different work ethics and be have different, as David would say, professional interests. So I think that that idea of fairness is really ambiguous and it's important to have those conversations so you can have a, have a transition that gives your operation a chance to make it uh, further on down the road if that's what you're goal and plan and intention is and that's why i think it's really important to to talk about that the other thing i think that um gets a lot of causes a lot of um disgruntlement is the sweat equity issue and and sweat equity is uh the idea that you know you're not getting paid but you're you're earning you know, you're right in the business to kind of take it over in the future, but you're kind of compensated below uh, the market. And um, that is a tough thing uh, because it causes lots of uh, issues as as people start to think about, well, maybe that was too much sweat equity or not enough, or I've been working really hard and contributed to the growth of this operation. And not being compensated for it. And I think, so I think sometimes that issue, while it's easy, uh, it's an easy way to proceed, can lead to a lot of uh, disgruntlement uh, going forward. And I, and I, and I think it's even true in, in non-family businesses. I mean, um, you know, you might have partners where um, maybe the partners are working below their market compensation uh, to try and keep keep things going. Um, and, you know, it's important to communicate that to, to the employees and other people uh, to understand, you know, the risks that those people are taking and, and um, that ultimately they <laughs> expect to be compensated um, at you know, normal levels. The other thing I think that is really important to think about in these transitions, and particularly uh, when we get to um, equipment, is what the tax implications are. And they can be quite complicated and quite complex. And it's really important to work through those with trusted uh, advisors that can give you good advice for how to deal with those issues so it's not as simple as you know it might not just be the right thing to just buy all, all the equipment at market price if that's just going to result in gigantic tax bills and that's not something that most people um want to do so important to have some good good advisors uh helping you and then finally i think one of the things that david is always encouraging me to think about and i think this is a good idea when you get stuck uh, you can't make uh, headway. Sometimes it's because we're just focused on, you know, trying to get just the perfect, perfect situation. You know, uh, my son was playing baseball the other night and there are lots of strikes going by and he wasn't swinging. You know, why, why weren't you swinging those pitches? And you, I was really, I wanted to get a, get a really good pitch. I thought I was going to get a better pitch to hit. And sometimes you just need to swing and put the ball in play or just do it as you might, as uh, I guess uh, Nike might have said back in the day, I guess a long time ago. Um, but one of the ways to think about that is to come up with these anti-goals. And that's what do you want to, what do you want to avoid? So let's say, okay, if it were our, our goal for this operation to end and our kids to, <clears throat> excuse me, never talk to each other again. What are some of the things that we could do to make that happen? And, and 
that gives you a chance to kind of think about, oh, yeah, maybe we should avoid doing some of those things, right? Um, because nobody wants, wants you know, your kids fighting uh, over all of this and have everybody upset at the end of it. Uh, nobody goes into it with that idea. And the other thing I think to think about is, you know, we all have that story of, you know, oh, the neighbors over there did this and it resulted in, you know, a bad situation. Sometimes it's important to think about and look at that and go, hey, here's some of the things they did. And that's kind of what led to it. And likewise, uh, I think we can all think of examples where it worked out pretty darn well. And people did a really good job of sharing their farm and, and transitioning it. So think about some of those things too. So at this point in the conversation, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Valerie to help us uh, dig even deeper into this topic. Uh, let's kick it off by having you introduce yourself a little bit. Yes, thanks, David. Um, I have been with Farm Credit Services of America right at 20 years. I started out in our Emmitsburg, Iowa office, uh, Northwestern Iowa, and worked as a financial officer there. Joined our commercial lending team not quite two years ago now and specialize in working with uh, pork producers across our territory at this point in time. Grew up on a family farming operation in northeastern Iowa, and today my husband and I participate in a cash grain operation, row crop, row crop operation, uh, that actually has some family components to it as well. So very familiar, have seen a lot of different uh, scenarios with customers I've worked with, and hope I can add some good insights here today. Well, great. Well, I, the first question I have here is what advice do you have for farmers who are sort of getting started with this transition plan conversation, especially as it regards those assets that they're thinking about? So the earlier you can begin the communication process on this, the better. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. We talked about the custom plans there. And so just beginning that conversation and having that open, clear conversation with all family members is gonna be a great way to lay the foundation for an asset transfer plan. The other thing that does is if you have on-farm heirs, that can help provide them with some peace of mind of what this might look like. If there's unknowns, I've seen some operations where they just don't do anything because they're so concerned about what happens if something happens to mom and dad and they need to buy out siblings. So having that plan, having that communication can really give peace of mind to all generations. What is something that folks often overlook as they're working through their, their plans here? So you don't have to develop your plan by yourself. There's Make yourself a team of trusted business advisors that can help with this plan together for you. Um, you're going to need your lender, your accountant, an attorney. And, and you may need to look for some specialized resources, too, as you look at that accountant and attorney that specialize in Asset transfer, estate planning, succession planning, because because they're out there and uh, have some good ideas. The other thing to think about as you put together your team there, you don't have to be the one that has the answers. You can use the expertise of your teammates uh, and really just need to communicate then your goals and what you're looking for from the plan and allow the, the team members to use their expertise to really craft the plan that works best for you. The other thing I'd add there is it takes a long time to put this together and to get it implemented. Uh, it took you a long time to build your farm, to build up your asset base, and it's going to take a while to unwind that as well. If you have a transfer plan that involves buyout of assets, uh, a lot of times the next generation doesn't have the capital available to do all of that at one time. So you need to come up with a plan that works for everybody and allows you some time and flexibility for purchasing, sales, tax implications. Uh, a lot of things go into that that a plan can't come together overnight. Let's dig a little bit more into that uh, that timing of how long it takes or the timing about executing on that plan. What are the few other factors that producers should keep in mind? Yeah, so I think one of the fears people have is if they start a plan, they think they're committed to being done. And um, that starting a plan and getting a plan in place doesn't commit you to being done. I think most people would happily take your labor, your management support for as long as you're willing to offer it. But um, I think you just have to be willing to start doing something and, and kind of put a horizon out there. If you need to make adjustments, goals change, circumstances change, you can always revisit a plan. It's not set in concrete. Uh, you just need to be able to start it and then kind of give yourself a timeline to work from from there. The other thing with timing, I think it's really important to revisit your plan 
update your plan, make sure it still is a fit for your operation. Um, uh, an example comes to mind of an operation where they'd done a great job of laying out a plan. And the plan was put together at a time where land values are not what they are today. Um, so a 19, late 80s, early 90s type of a plan and allowed for some cash value of life insurance to buy out heirs. Uh, but if that plan isn't updated, which this one wasn't, uh, that dollar amount is no longer sufficient to provide that buyout under today's land values. And the goals of the heirs have also changed. Um, you know, at the time the plan was put together, they were in their prime of farming and looking to continue to grow and expand the operation. Um, as time has passed and the asset transfer hasn't taken place, the, they're no longer looking to expand and grow. They're approaching retirement on their own. So um, the plan really just never kept up with the intention of the operation. I think that's really important too. Yeah, we would never want our transition to plan the one that we're actively using to turn into a time capsule. Uh, we always want to make sure that we're revising and, and updating that. And you mentioned land values changing, goals changing over time. What are some other factors um, that might trigger us to revisit that? Maybe that trigger us, it's time to revisit that, that transition plan. So you know, you, you've added additional assets. Uh, I think that's always a good time. The triggering event, you've taken out new loans with Farm Credit Services of America. Another triggering event that may cause you to take a look at that plan. Also, if you've added any enterprises, changed any enterprises, decreased an enterprise, any of those big operational changes is also a great time to look at the plan. Um, and I think the goals piece is, is really important because that's where that open communication amongst all generations really comes into play. Uh, and people need to be willing to say, hey, my goal used to be this, but this is no longer my goal. And, and then they need to come up with a new plan. It's really important to keep in mind. Um, really appreciate you sharing that. We've talked a lot about transitioning in the assets. I want to ask you as a lender, what are some other transition related topics that come to your mind in this space? So I think an asset that we maybe don't think of, we think of land, we think of machinery and equipment, but management expertise is really an asset to a lot of these operations. And thinking about that transition of management, decision-making skills, training along the, the operational, as opposed to the day-to-day, -day, but really the big picture and operational goal side of things for an operation. I think that's something that we also need to keep in mind as we think about assets. And allowing people that are going to be inheriting assets or you know, buying assets to take on more of those day-to-day -day management and big picture operational uh, tasks is also pretty important. So I have two questions here before we hit the 30 minute mark. The first one specifically on farm transitioning here and specifically these assets, what is this something that we've might've missed or that you wanna emphasize here before we wrap up? Put, put, put your plan in writing. You may have a plan and it's great and you have in your head how you think this is all supposed to go, but go ahead and, and take the steps formalize it, put it in writing, work with your lender, your CPA, your attorney, and really get it done. Nobody likes to think about these things because it signals a change in your lifestyle, a change in how you do things. And that can be something that you'd rather avoid, but put it in writing, get it done, take those steps, and then uh, use those triggering events, changing goals, changing assets to revisit it. It's not something that's set in stone, so it is something you do have to take a look at periodically. So, This last question here, it can be specific to today's topic or more broadly, what's a piece of advice that you'd put on a billboard for thousands of producers to see here in June 2023? Um, just you hate to see what happens when people don't plan. Making a Doing no planning is making a decision for your operation, and you may not be happy with the outcome. Uh, at least if you have a plan that gives you something to come back and revisit, check in with, and you can adjust your plan as circumstances change. Let me hand it back on over to Brent. Uh, and what kind of questions do we have today? I see there's quite a few. Yeah, Carly, thanks. It's uh, good to have some questions. And uh, we had one come in and says, you know, I'm, I'm willing to sell uh, my son some equipment at maybe 50 cents on the dollar because normal sales, the taxes would really chew into that 
and I enter into a contract over 10 years or so, so I don't get stung with taxes as much. Um, and my son can, you know, take tax deductions, et cetera. Um, good question. Um, and I can't tell you the answer to that um, because uh, I think that's one we have to talk to an accounting professional about because but it's it's a really good question. I think it's even more important today um, because the value of the equipment has gotten so large that um, there's just significant portions of basically you know, your retirement tied up in uh, that equipment and uh, taking all of that income in one year, as you know, would have some pretty significant um, tax implications because most all of it is probably fully depreciated on the tax basis. So um, the best advice I think I can give is, you know, get some good accounting advice as to as to what the best option is. Yeah, I would just add, Brent, that I think getting some good accounting advice is a great place to start. But then also, as you look at your machinery line, try to think about what you can change today as you make new purchases and how you can maybe help to facilitate some of that asset transfer today on anything you may be trading in or purchasing new. If I could just jump in and add one last thought. I think this is a really great start. The question is itself creates more good questions. And so one of the questions that came to my mind is, you know, is your son interested in that deal? And so just having that conversation with your son and hearing his thoughts and his concerns can really help you maybe before you get to that that accountant phase of that conversation. So it's a very iterative process. It takes a lot of feedback and it, it's sort of working towards this uh, this action item, but it can take several rounds of of feedback from those you're working with closely, the next generation, but also all the trusted advisors along the way. Yeah. So a couple of good questions here. Um, after you determine fairness, which is, is as we talked about, uh, pretty hard, should your first stop be the lawyer, the lender, the accountant? And uh, that that's a that's a clever question. Um, I like those. Um, and I don't I don't know. I think getting to fairness is really important, but you're probably uh, going to have to talk to all three. And um, honestly, it probably is going to help if you talk to them all three kind of not necessarily at the same time but in concert so that one doesn't come up with a plan that the other one hates uh, and vice versa so it's pretty important i think to coordinate with with all three of them if we have on farm and off farm errors should business assets uh, not not the land, but business assets be held separately, uh, or is this a case by case? And I think this is again another one. It's back to that you know deal of the cookie cutter solution. I don't think there's a really good uh, answer to that in the sense that what's going to work for one person might not work for another, and um, and so I I think you just have there's pros and cons. I think to all of that. Um, you start creating lots of different entities. It becomes, you know, more paperwork, more record keeping, more stuff that seems a little bit like um, not as useful of motion, uh, but at the same time uh, can be useful for a variety of purposes. So uh, again, I think you need to get a variety of opinions, not just one. Um, because, you know, it's like, I think Warren Buffett always used that quote, you know, it's like asking a, a barber if you need a haircut. It's like if you go and ask a, an attorney or an accountant if you need another entity, they're going to say yes. Um, but it may not be, it, it may not be the most efficient um, um, way to approach things. So I, th I think, you know, use some skepticism, but talk and, and engage a little bit. Don't just don't just take the first solution that's offered to you unless you're really confident in it. And Brent, just to build off what you said earlier, you said pros and cons. I think about these as trade-offs also is as you're hearing all that feedback, really get into those details of what the trade-offs are. And um, 
if you're only hearing all the pros from one 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 source of information, you know, talk to somebody else. Really try to build. And we call this triangulation, right? You try to figure out uh, what all the sources of information are and find what works really good for you. But we have to lean into those those pros and those cons and those trade offs to really understand uh, the nuances and how they might work or might not work for our operation. Yeah. So um, another idea here, another question is, um, what about pros and cons of uh, purchasing stuff, you know, while the person's alive versus uh, waiting to uh, passing? Another good question with a lot of tax implications. Um, of course, it, as, as one waits, there's the step up basis still exists. And so that's a a good thing and it avoids a lot of capital gains tax uh on things like land um but on the on the downside uh if the person who owns that stuff needs the money um it doesn't do them much good to get the money after they're gone so i think it, it kind of just depends a little bit on the situation and that also leads into another question about you know the pros and cons of trusts versus uh, entities like, you know, corporations or LLCs or whatnot. And again, I think those are, I mean, just personally something I'm, uh, trying to understand myself right now. Um, there's, there's pros and cons to all of it. And, uh, I haven't decided what I'm doing myself. So, uh, I can't give you a good answer on that. Um, cause I think there's, there's pros and cons to all of that. I think one thing to think about too is, you know, really you'd like your family members to be alive as long as possible. Uh, so, <laughs> but you also then have to think about who needs the asset and who needs to control the asset and how is that asset being used in the operation? Uh, because some assets are definitely more conducive to holding on to for your lifetime. I think we typically think of real estate as, as one there where others are, are probably less conducive to that um, just because of, of lifespan and, and, and usability time period of, of that tractor or that combine or whatever that piece of equipment may be. So I think that's something to take into consideration too, is who needs the asset and what are they planning to do with it? Good points, Valerie. One thing I know about this topic is that there's so much, um, so much to learn, so much to talk about, so much personalization that needs to go into this. And if you're at the point where you're looking to get started, um, reach out to your uh, financial officer, your local office, if you're not sure. We have a couple great resources of companies that do this work. It's not something that we are necessarily the experts in, but we are certainly able to get you in contact with some folks that we um, trust and have, have done a great job for us. So keep that in mind. If you're ready to start that conversation, we can certainly help you get that started. So with that note, that'll do it for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender. Thank you to Brent, David, and Val for leading today's conversation. And for you in the audience, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you online again next month.